Battlefield 2 is a great game, and we already talked about this masterpiece for nearly 20 minutes. Still, we did not manage to cover everything. So welcome to a new episode of the history of Battlefield. This time about the add-ons and booster packs for Battlefield 2. Nearly five months after the initial release of Battlefield 2, Battlefield 2 Special Forces was released on November 21st, 2005. And like the name suggests, we left the battlefield of normal soldiers to join special operation forces, militias or resistance fighters. The fights always seemed a bit big for special force units, because the add-on was in essence merely a reskin of the original. Which meant you played with up to 63 other players on 8 new maps, fighting over flag points. The scope of the operations seemed a bit big for special forces, to a layman at least. But even if you never felt like a special force unit from Rainbow Six, DICE made some design choices which altered the feeling of the add-on enough to put you in the right mood most of the times. The first difference you will notice when firing up the game is one that I really like. The developers put more focus on the infantry, as special forces units rarely move in with a main battle tank. Most of the maps only feature small, fast-moving vehicles which have none to barely any protection. They are made to move fast from point A to B like a jet ski, quad, a civilian car or a forklift for some reason. The latter one does not fall in the category of fast vehicle, but yet it exists. Next to the fast vehicles, we have some slower but more deadly transport vehicles. Like the Technical, which is just a normal pickup, a a grey Honda Hilux to be precise, with a machine gun mounted on top. It offered more protection and could even defend itself against infantry, but it turned into a burning piece of scrap metal when engaged with explosives pretty quickly. The next extraordinary vehicle is the AIL Desert Raider, a reconnaissance vehicle designed by the Israeli army. Thanks to its six wheels, it has almost the off-road capabilities of a tracked vehicle, but retains the speed of a regular truck. With its three front-mounted machine guns, it can take out infantry very quickly and effectively. The last light-armored vehicle is the Humvee, with a huge Tau missile launcher on top. It was the only heavily armed fast vehicle, which could take out other vehicles quickly in, and it provided a good amount of protection against enemy fire. The Tau Humvee was cause for some controversy, as it caused the server to crash if you fired the Tau missile, a bug which I found out very quickly, and we used to crash a lot of servers accidentally by not knowing what caused it at first. Luckily, this got patched rather quickly. Battlefield 2 Special Forces also features some heavily armed vehicles borrowed from the main game, the BTR-90 and T-90. The BMP-3 was the only heavy ground vehicle addition to the game in this add-on. But we also got the well-known and loved AH-64 Apache attack helicopter, as well as the beloved Mi-24 attack and transport helicopter from the Russian army, also known as the Hind. Let's talk about the new maps that were added in the Special Forces add-on, because they display the change of focus from big battlefields to more infantry set at close quarter combat very well. While we are fighting on beautiful beaches and wonderful valleys in Battlefield 2, in the Special Forces add-on we are fighting in greyish and brownish cities with burning rubble under dark skies. The accusation of an always grey and brownish color scheme levied against Battlefield 2 far more applies to Special Forces, but here it was a really fitting design choice from DICE. But not all maps were created in such dull colors, some maps are way darker. Several of the maps featured are taking place at night, long before DICE introduced night maps with their stunning frostbite engine we could already fight in the dark. The night maps had really nice charm, but even back then you could see that the engine wasn't really the pinnacle of technology even back then, and nighttime environments weren't really the strong point of this engine. Nonetheless, it was great fun fighting against other players during night. Because thanks to the brownish and dark uniforms of the soldiers, they could hide really well in the dark, which made the fights very intensive. Most maps provided the infantry with lots of places to take cover and hide, some flag points could not be reached with vehicles at all, further setting it apart from the main game. 
curiously, I find the setting and concepts of the maps that came with the add-on far more memorable than the maps themselves. Devil's Purge, Ghost Town, Iron Gator, Leviathan, Mass Destruction, Night Fight, Surge and Warlord. None of the maps stood out in my memory, except one. In the Surge, the Spence Nas are fighting against rebels who managed to buy some used rocket parts on the black market, put them together and tried to launch them on an abandoned launch pad. But I think it is more the fact about the rocket than the map itself that I can remember it. I don't know why I don't have such good memories of the maps, maybe because I didn't play the add-on as much as I played the regular Battlefield 2. Or maybe the maps are not that good compared to Strike at Karkant, Gulf of Oman or Wake Island. Nonetheless, I love the ideas and the approach that they chose for these maps. But not only new maps and vehicles were introduced, some new weapons were also introduced with this add-on. Some of which made it into the main game, like the F-2000, which was seen in the previous video as well. Battlefield 2 dared to make the step into modern warfare long before modern warfare. I can remember I even killed a teammate just to get his F-2000. I guess I was kind of an asshole back then. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. But back to Special Forces. The players got the first generation of the Belgian FN Scar H and L, the before mentioned F2000, the German Heckland Koch G36E, the G36KV, which is called G36K in this game and has a 3 round burst mode, which it doesn't have in real life, and then there's also the MG36. I love that there's so many German guns. Oh, and of course, the most popular anti-tank grenade launcher, the RPG-7, made an appearance as well. The interesting thing is that only Western factions got new and fancy weapons. The Spetsnaz, the Russian Special Forces, the Militia and the Rebels are using old Russian weapons, like the AK-101, AK-74 and the RPK. Not the oldest tech, but certainly no new fancy developments. Well, the weapons are nice and I love some of them, the F2000 especially, but the real highlights are the gadgets, and I know all the veterans were waiting for this moment. The gadgets on their own are nothing too exciting, new or special, but they enhance the gameplay quite a lot. The first new gadget we are going to talk about is the Flashbang. The Assault class received this tactical device to flash enemies in a big radius, and if standing too close to the detonation, the Flashbang blinds you for nearly 20 seconds. Being completely blinded is a real nuisance, which makes this one of the strongest flashbangs in the entire gaming world. I mean, it is immense compared to Counter-Strike's flashbangs. The second new element, which is more of a gun than a gadget to be honest, is the Federal M201Z gas gun, which launches grenades or rubber pellets. This weapon's real-world application is mostly against rioters for crowd control. In Battlefield 2 Special Forces, it launches tear gas grenades which, if you are affected, obstruct your vision and cause you to cough immensely. This not only makes it harder to find and kill enemy players, it also reveals your position thanks to the audio cue. And since the machine gunner got this gun, ammunition was practically infinite. To counter enemy or even your own tear gas, you could put on a gas mask, something we later saw only in Battlefield 1. And just like in this newer entry into the series, the mask restricted your field of vision and made it harder to hear the enemy due to the loud breathing sound. Go, go, go! Give me a lift. The next very useful gadget, at least in the previously mentioned night maps, is the night vision device. With the press of a button, your screen gets a greenish tint, you hear the iconic sound and then you can finally see in the dark. A gadget that no Special Forces unit is allowed to miss is the zipline. The Spec Ops soldier and the sniper got equipped with a little crossbow, with which you could shoot a zipline cable to escape from an elevated position. Curious, who would even willingly give up the high ground? The last gadget is the best one in my eyes, because it enables you to get to the high ground. The grappling hook. The assault and anti-tank soldier were given this little gadget which they could throw up 15 meters or 49 feet into the air, which is rather impressive. And this gave the players completely new ways to play the map. It offered new ways to sneak around the enemy, create new ambushes or foolishly putting yourself on a platter by skylining yourself for an enemy sniper. Imagine you are surrounded by your enemies, hundreds of grenades flying through the air, 
Your teammates are dying in a constant spam of explosives, but you run through the danger. Throw a grappling hook up into the air, it lands on a house, you jump on the rope, climb the roof and begin to rain down revenge. Killing one enemy, another one and the next one. They don't know where it's coming from, they are confused. They are trying to hide, looking for you, but you take out more and more. Your team finally gets a moment to breathe and it takes up the initiative to strike back. I had moments like that. One of my personal battlefield moments. These moments burn deep into my memories. It was such an awesome moment where this little gadget, a brave idea, changed the entire battle. My team and I managed to turn it around and fight the enemy back to the main base. This freedom of movement that the grappling hook and the zipline allowed for is one of the many things that I am missing from modern battlefield games. After the very successful add-on, DICE chose another approach, which got criticized harshly, at least here in Germany. I remember very well how GameStar, especially Petra Schmitz from Set Magazine, did not approve of it. Instead of giving us a complete add-on, DICE introduced something called Booster Pack, which costed 10 euros, at least here in Germany. In this booster pack, you got a download key for a couple of maps, weapons or vehicles. We would call this DLC today, just that this little booster pack was available in a retail store. The first booster pack or DLC, which was released in March, was called Euroforces and like the name suggests, it gave us the NATO, the European Combined Armed Forces and their equipment. We got 7 new weapons, two of which could be used in the main game. These new guns were the French FAMAS the British L85A2, the British sniper rifle A96A1, the German Hecklaunt Koch 21 and HK53, as well as the Belgian FNP90. The L96A1 sniper rifle and the P90 are the two weapons available in the main game. The new vehicles were the British Challenger 2, the German Leopard 2, the AS665 Tiger helicopter, a French-German corporation which was called the Eurocopter in-game, and the Typhoon, a jet fighter, also a French-German co-production. The three new maps were The Great Wall, where the NATO engages the Chinese army on the eponymous Great Wall, and the two other maps were the Tabara Quarry and Operation Smokescreen, where the NATO confronts the MEC. None of these maps are quite unique or special, maybe the Great Wall thanks to its setting. None of them were particularly well balanced, especially on the 16 player versions you notice that DICE didn't put that much effort into these maps. They felt rushed and only 3 months after Euroforces we got the next little expansion, the last booster pack called Armored Fury. Fury. We got 3 new maps, no new weapons and some new vehicles. The new maps were Midnight Sun, a map based on Port Valdez where the Chinese try to get control of an important oil pipeline and the United States Marine Corps is trying to prevent that. Then we have Operation Road Rage, a fight on an interchange where the United States Marine Corps tries to fight back the MEC on the east coast. And the last new map was Operation Harvest, a map located in Lancaster County where the MEC tries to push back the US Marine Corps. By the way, all the new maps were located in the United States, for those who didn't notice that yet. The new vehicles were the Zuhoi 25 Frogfoot, the Q5, a Chinese ground attack aircraft, the well known AH 6, also called Little Bird, the Eurocopter EC 635 for the MEC, the WZ 11 for the Chinese, a muscle car, I mean, well, we are in the US, so you need a big muscle car, a trailer truck, and the last one, my beloved A 10 Thunderbolt 2, the Warthog. It was a real shame that it took nearly a year to get one of the most iconic planes to appear in Battlefield 2. The bigger shame was however EA's conduct towards the customer base. When taking a closer look at the add-on and booster packs, you'll get a sour taste in your mouth. Considering the fun fact that Battlefield 2 launched with game breaking bugs, not just little glitches, I mean real game crashes. It was a damn bold move to divert resources over to a follow up project before your current product isn't even in a working order. It is clear that the development on the Special Forces add-on was started long before Battlefield 2 launched. The Special Forces add-on introduced new mechanics, which were repurposed cut content to a large extent. The booster packs on the other side didn't even introduce new gameplay elements, except for the vehicle drop for the commander, which also caused a lot of bugs and glitches. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. The booster pack release method opened the door to a new, more nefarious way of content releasing the now dreaded DLC. It is sad that this also became a part of the legacy of this great game. I am a big fan of Battlefield 2 and I love it. 
It is one of the best games in my opinion, and it will always have a special place in my heart, even if many things weren't right in and around Battlefield. But that's it for today. Special thanks goes to our loyal patrons, who of course got to see this video first. To them and to everyone else, thank you for watching. We hope you'll tune in next time when we take a look at the cut content of Battlefield 2, an episode I am personally really looking forward to. Furthermore, we are going to take a look at the mods Forgotten Hope 2 and Project Reality, like many of you suggested. So, see you guys next time. Till then, have a nice day and as always, goodbye and guten Tag.